Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 127, The Rick Beckfeld Hockey Journey. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Petlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we, more like I, revisit with someone from my past that was a huge mentor in helping me transition from retiring from the NHL to what I'm going to do for the rest of my life mode and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. My next guest has been interweaving in and out of my life for as long as I can remember. He's worn many hockey hats through his journey, from player, to coach, to skills instructor, to business owner, to USHL scout, climbing all the way to the top, most recently scouting for the Arizona Coyotes in the NHL. We're going to peel back all the layers of the onion, leaving no stone unturned to reveal how this guy has stayed around the game of hockey his entire life. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Rick Beckfeld to the show. Mr. Beckfeld, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Thanks, Pitt. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Man, it's been a it's been a journey, and it's been a while since you and I have uh, connected. You used to have a, um, a auto mechanic uh, fixer car fixer upper shopper, and I used to bring my vehicles in there all the time. But you have since sold that place, so I don't get to see you anymore. How's uh, life in retirement going? Uh, life is great. I can't. Uh... I can't kick about anything in the re- from the retirement end. I pretty much can um, can do what I want to do when I want to do it if I want to do it. Um, it's pretty it's pretty sweet. I can't lie. I'm happy. Are you on a two nap minimum? <laughs> yeah. You know, I've kind of fallen back to the old hockey days where you get about the the two o'clock power nap for about forty five minutes, and uh, then you're ready to go. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So. Um, my, my fans of the hockey journey podcast they're they don't like, you know, dumping, you know, chase or playing the trap. They, they want us to get right to it. So we're, we're getting the four check going. So if you don't mind, my friend, um, let's go back to the beginning. Let's rewind the tape and, uh, start. Where'd you grow up? What was your childhood like? Uh, your parents, brothers, sisters, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports. Basically, give the listeners a glimpse, a little tiny peek ski, what it was like growing up. Rick Beckfeld. Sure. I, I grew up, uh, much like you, Pitt, in beautiful New Hope, Minnesota, uh, playing minor youth hockey. Um, back in that time, there wasn't any organized hockey till you got to Pee Wee's. So, Basically, what we did is we just skated on outside ice whenever we had a chance. Um, let's let's, let, let, let's, yeah. let's get a little time frame. You know, are we in the 80s? Are we back in the 60s? You know, <laughs> we're let, back let's, in the 60s, Pat. We're back in we're, the 60s, right? What's the hottest that, car? What's the hottest car back then? Oh God, I don't even couldn't even tell you. <laughs> One that got me back and forth to wherever I needed to go. I think my, <laughs> I think uh, just about most families back then had station wagons, and uh, there was no minivans, none of that stuff yet. So we would travel in the family station wagon when we had to, whenever we had to go someplace. And it was usually, most of the times when we had to get to the rink, uh, just for for skating on our own, we would walk. Um, I remember Cooper High School, for instance. Um, 
had two outdoor rinks and they were lighted. And um, the hockey coach at the time, um, his name was uh, Anderson, and he also, Chuck Anderson, and he also manned the warming house at the rink. So he was there all the time, did the flooding, did this and that. And I remember as a young player going up there and breaking a stick and coming into the into the, the dressing room there where he was, and uh, he would sell you a stick and tape it up for you for two bucks. And if you didn't have the money, he'd just say, bring it next time. Um, yeah. You know, it was a different it was a different time. And like I said, there was no youth hockey until uh, organized until you got to Pee Wee. So that's my first my first chance at playing any kind of organized hockey when I was a Pee Wee, which nowadays sounds sounds crazy because kids are playing at five years old. And um, I, I don't know if it was, if it's better or worse, but it, but it's what it was, and it was a fun time. You played with your buddies. Sometimes there were games of eighteen people on the ice at one time. Sometimes there were four, um, all outside, and all my whole youth hockey was played outside. Uh, never played a never played a, um, a youth hockey game in an indoor arena. Just wasn't there wasn't any, and weren't available. So it was kind of oh. kind of different. Um, I know you can relate to some of the outside skating. Uh, you, you played your, your fair share of outs- on outside ice. And uh, there's something kind of mythical about it, playing outside. And we kind of saw it in evidence this weekend. If you watch the Hockey Day in Minnesota up in War Road, um, it was, it's kind of a cool venue when the weather's right. right. Yeah, what would happen uh, today if we had a couple years like we're having here in Minnesota? I mean, it's... January 30th and there is zero zero snow on the ground there's no outdoor ice I mean holy cow that the game might have disappeared in the United States or at least in Minnesota then at least in Minnesota for certain um there just wasn't the other options but but you know you can even remember back um to the time when there was never uh, never a, a winter where there was no snow um, it wasn't a matter of, of whether we were going to get snow. It was, gonna, it was how much snow we were going to get. And we used to be able to get on, on, start skating outside. I remember skating over Thanksgiving outside. And uh, it was a different time. Weather patterns were different. And we basically had the benefit of uh, having an unlimited supply of outdoor ice, which enabled uh, some of the great hockey players from this area to excel and to become better. That's why we were better than, than the other states in producing hockey players is just because we had that, we had that resource, that natural resource, and we could play nonstop for four, four months a year on outside ice. And, um, like you said, in today's world, that's, that isn't there anymore, unfortunately. No, it's a, it's definitely the landscape, uh, has changed. So, you spent a lot of time on the outdoor ice. Uh, when you did get to organized hockey, um, when you know, how did that kind of change your outlook? Because you ended up, I, I, I think you played some pro over in Europe, but I know you played college hockey. But yep. you know, talk about kind of if if the sport of hockey, especially at the grassroots level, is you know, just kind of getting organized. Um, when did when did the, the light flick on that there might be a possibility to play past your high school years? Well, it was actually um, th- my second year out of high school. I, I actually didn't play uh, my first year out of high school. There wasn't any there wasn't any place to play uh, at that point in time. You either went to college. And there was, um, um, th- there really wasn't a, a, there was one team, the, um, the Vulcans, St. Paul Vulcans were just starting, but it was a very, there was one team and it was very, very difficult to, to get into that, that mix. So I didn't play. And then there was another league started my, uh, second year out of high school. And, um, it was a junior league, but it was, a uh, I can't even remember the name of the league, but our team was called the North, uh, the North Hennepin junior blazers. And, um, we played a schedule with, there was a team in, in, uh, East St. Paul. There was a team in Faribault, a team in St. Cloud, um, Stillwater had a team and, and we played a schedule there. And then, um, 
that was when I thought, you know what? I, I would love to keep playing this game if at all possible. And that's probably the the year that I worked harder than uh, on being a hockey player than any other year in, in my life uh, because it was a big transition. And uh, I did get the opportunity to play Division three college hockey in Wisconsin and um, uh, ended up playing for four years and, and enjoyed the heck out of that. And uh, But I always had kind of a goal in the back of my mind was to make a buck playing hockey somehow, some way to do it. Um, and then I got the opportunity to play over in Austria um, in the year after I got a, finished my college and took advantage of that. And, and again, another, another great experience. But I knew at that point that that, that was as big as it was going to get for me. And uh, it was time to move on. Um, and so then I came back to the States and, and uh, eventually met my future wife, um, got married and had a family. And it was probably maybe three or four years, maybe even longer than that, because I think my son, Brett, would have been was five um, when I kind of started getting involved in in the skill development part of it and started to kind of break that down and want to know more about how you develop players and that's kind of how I originally got into it was just because my son was in it and I wanted to I wanted to to help him and and uh, and it just kind of grew from there. Um, was this with the, the Armstrong, uh, youth hockey program that you started coaching at? Yes. Yes. It was, I, I really never coached a team, uh, in the Armstrong program. I, I learned early on that, um, if you want to help your, your son is stay out of his way. And I, I've seen too many, too many overbearing parents that have, um, they haven't enhanced their son or daughter's careers, but they've actually been a negative on it. So I, I figured out, and, and whenever I would tell my son something or suggest something, I knew it went one ear and out the other. And um, so ultimately, when I got into more of the skills development and uh, started a business called, uh, at the time it was called Armstrong Individual Skills Clinics for Armstrong players, uh, I started it with. Um, with a uh, a guy by the name of uh, Steve Bernhardt, and I figured out early on that if I saw something in in Brett that I thought needed correcting, I would tell Steve, and he would tell Brett, and then it would make sense. But if it came from me, it was coming from his dad. And no so you don't know nothing. <laughs> you know absolutely nothing. And uh, and so that's kind of I thought you know I this works. And all through, whenever I was on the ice with him, um, until he was a, a Bantam, when the light finally went off, that, hey, the old man might actually know something, um, I would relay everything to another guy uh, on the ice with me. And uh, it seemed to just have a better result, and I could just kind of focus on being his dad and and kind of keep it at that. Uh, so, yeah, with the... You know that and that's kind of on the on the hockey background part, I guess, um, if you would. And then the, like I said, the Armstrong Individual Skills Clinics we ran. In fact, your uh, your brother Adam was one of our first students uh, in the Armstrong Skills Clinics, um, and it was it was we did it one night a week. It was Sunday Sunday evening, and uh, it was all summer long. But I just noticed that. In watching players, um, there was a lack of, of skill. There just wasn't good skill. They got up and down the ice fine. They could stop and they could hit and they could do all those things and shoot, but there just wasn't a good skill element. And I thought that was a piece that needed to be um, needed to be explored a little more and and potentially put into a program. And uh, it was shortly after that that I actually got hired by the Armstrong youth program to run skills clinics for them. And around that same time, um, Cooper, who had also started a skills clinic, Duke Johnson, um, for a couple of years, he ran that and I ran Armstrong and then we decided to merge them. And then we basically just called it individual skills clinics. And then we opened it up to 
um, not just Cooper and Armstrong kids, but, but all kids. But the one thing we always did, we always capped our registration at, uh, we always capped it at 16 per session, just because we felt that you start to get more players and they're not going to get the individual attention and it's, it's not going to have a benefit. So we've always done that. And, and even today, um, the business is still operating. And even today, we, we cap it. And uh, just so that everybody gets reps, everybody gets individual attention. And now we've got, we've got four coaches out there, four instructors out there, um, instead of just the two when we kind of started it. So um, you learn a lot along the way, as you know. Um, so, yeah, that kind of, you know, that was a big thing um, for me. And it was a learning experience. And every year, every year I did it, I, I learned. And I'd learned from watching other skills instructors. I know when I started to get into the skating piece, I really, really was, was interested in, in, in how the mechanics work. And, and uh, a, a good friend of yours who I, I read a lot about, uh, talked to, was Jack Blatherwick. Um, not so much on the skating piece, but just how everything worked in the body, within the body to provide the power um, and the training part. And uh, you know, so I learned from him, and I also spent quite a bit of time um, watching Barry Karn, who I think was a, he still does it today, is, is one of the best um, skating instructors, yeah, uh, especially on a one-on-one -on -one basis with kids. And... Um, so you know you learn from others. You don't you you don't invent anything in this game. You really don't. You just kind of look, watch, learn from others. Maybe you tweak it a little bit that you think might work better. But it isn't a it isn't a new science we invent. It's simply it's been there the whole time. It's just tweaking things and uh, and making them uh, making them so they work at least in your mind they work a little better. You know, from a coaching perspective, I agree with you that there, the majority of what we're introducing to players has been, you know, served up uh, just on a different platter and a different year. But I think the the real, uh, you know, growth that we have uh, as in, instructors is the the delivery of you know how we say things and what. What messaging are we telling them on a consistent basis when they they get off track or they they don't get the result they want? You know, when they're frustrated, that that's to me the the real diamonds in the rough. When you can start having you know that become seamless uh, as part of your lesson, you know, where they're struggling, but you got something that just pops into your head that this makes them be able to just move on to the next little moment. Yeah, you're exactly right. And and there's every player is built differently. You know, you can't when you, when you get into the skating piece especially, you can't take a 5 foot 10 quick footed defenseman and have him skate the same or have a 6 foot 3 220 pound defenseman skate the same as that guy, as that smaller D. Same thing with forwards. You know, God gave us quick twitch or he didn't. And some of people are blessed with it. Others aren't. So if you try to take a bigger player who's very, very slow twitch, but very powerful and try to make him a quick twitch player, it's never going to work. You're, you're, it's a finite um, with the quick twitch. But the power piece, if you, if you can learn to do things correctly, the power piece is infinite. The more power you get, the more power you develop, the more power you can utilize in your skating, you get faster. And that's obviously the goal of every hockey player is to be faster. And instead of coming through, move, coming from moving your feet faster, um, it comes from pushing harder, pushing more ice. You and I talked about pushing ice. That's what we do out there. Um, the more ice we push, the more power we develop. And the more power, that translates to speed. And so there are things like escape moves and, and starts and, and transitions that you can incorporate with bigger players utilizing power as opposed to, as opposed to the quick feet. And that gets lost, and I've seen it lost even in some of the, 
some of the skating instructors I've seen around. Um, they do more of a cookie cutter approach. So it's kind of the same thing for every player as opposed to play into that player's strengths and not trying to recreate him through his weaknesses. Um, I've, I've experienced a a lot of both and, uh, I've had a lot more success in, in simply learning how the, what the, what the player has and creating things, teaching him things that can enhance what he has. Um, using strength and power as opposed to quickness. So, you know, it's you got to kind of look at each player differently because every player is a little different. And every player has some skill, has some attributes, uh, not all the same. So let me ask you this. Uh, you, you talk about you, you, you've seen some instructors now where it's more of a cookie-cutter approach and... Um, do you think that that's because, uh, and I, I'm saying this is be, because where my kids grew up playing in the Wyzetta Youth Program, there there was an email sent out that they want to uh, they're they're at the beginning stage of trying to get a fourth sheet of ice. Uh, I heard another community, maybe Maple Grove, is trying to do the same thing. So the game must be growing, but is that is that kind of what what's happened because the the game's grown that people are just searching for any extra ice time and you're in a situation where you're in a skills camp but it's not like individual skills you have you know 40 players out there and there's two instructors trying to manage all those all those players do you did you know where i'm coming from absolutely absolutely and i think that the the rinks are being built because you're talking about two fairly affluential areas where there's money and let's face it, hockey is not a cheap sport. And when you can, when you come from a family that can afford it, um, families that can afford it, there's going to be more of a demand because the sport itself is great. But why is it, why is it thriving in the suburbs and why is it died? Why is it died in the cities? It's simply because of the, it's the money and it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the way it is. Now, as far as, you know, you put out, I found that when you get, and even youth coaches, for instance, I mean, God bless their hearts. They volunteer their time. They do what they can. And, and, but they may yell at you as a player to go faster or do this, but they have no idea how to teach that to you. How, I mean, players need roadmaps. They need somebody to say, okay, I need to go faster. How do I do that? Yeah. What do I do? But they don't have the ability, nor do they have the time to take an individual, even if they had the ability to take an individual player and spend a lot of time with them. They got a, they got a team of 15 to 20 kids, and they're trying to worry more about the game when they play Dinah next week as opposed to what's going to make one player on my team a little better. And it's, it's no knack on, I mean, it's no rip on them. It's just the situation as it is. There isn't the time for it. So the time for the development, the skill development is in the off season. And when you can get into smaller numbers and you can work with people in specific areas that are more qualified, and then you take what you've learned from that. Now, it doesn't, as you know, Pitt, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, you can't go and have one lesson with Scott Bukestad and, and, and come back and score 50 goals. It's learning from what he's taught or what I teach, or what you teach, and then practicing it on your own over and over and over, especially the skating part. Because during the course of a game, the last thing you think about is your skate. That just has to happen. You don't have time to think about that. So it has to be practiced over and over and over um, during the off season. And many players that I do individual training with, I'll get them back in this. They'll, they'll, their strides, everything looks great in the fall. And they'll come back in the spring. And it's like, what the hell happened? I mean, you're 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 not finishing anything. Your crossovers are short. They're choppy. Your upper body's like a windmill moving around. I mean, <laughs> what's going on? And it's just because muscle memory is that crazy thing, and it ultimately will come back to where they were, not in its entirety, but there'll be there'll be traits of it that will come back, and they won't even recognize it. I know I talk to players all the time, especially ones I've had for, for quite a few years. And we talk about um, self-correction. 
You know, you, you feel when you do it correct. Know how that feels. So you get in a game and you're during the season and something isn't working. Maybe it's a um, maybe it's a power escape out of a corner. Maybe whatever. You got to figure out why it's not working. You got to be able to self correct because there isn't anybody out there on your team or staff that's going to be able to tell you what you did wrong and how you need to fix it. You need to feel that, and that's a tremendous thing when you when you finally can get a hold of that and you can self correct yourself. That. That's big, that's huge, and um, but it's it's hard to get to that point. It takes time and work and experience. Yeah, just to to recognize it big time. Um, so you've always just done the the skill development. I mean, you talked about your son, uh, Brett. He played uh, growing up and uh, ended up playing college hockey, but. Uh, you never coached him uh, at any level, high school or anything? Other than the skill development piece. Um, I would be on the ice. You know, like I said, I was doing Armstrong skill development. I would be on the ice with his team many times for skill development. And he would be in, he would do all my summer programs. But as far as actually coaching, um, I never get did. My only coaching I did was for two years, I coached uh, a team in the in the high school elite league. And it was at that point that I figured out I really didn't enjoy the coaching aspect of it uh, as much as I thought. I enjoyed more the skill development piece than I did the actual X's and O's of coaching. It just wasn't, it just didn't get me pumped up. It just wasn't for me. And uh, um, like I said, a couple of years of it, and I, I, I learned that I'm, I'm better served doing other things. And, um, so that was, you know, those were the only two years I ever was really behind a bench coaching. When, uh, you know, you talk about, all right, coaching is not your deal, but you, and you also took over a family business. Uh, I mentioned in the, the intro that you mm -hmm. have a automotive care business. Yep. Um, so you, you had that and you, you still had an, enough time to add one more thing to your life. You started <laughs> scouting. How did that, well, was, how did that happen? Well, there was two more things. Actually, if you remember back, there was a um, company called uh, sweet hockey products. <laughs> so <laughs> we add that into the mix as well. There was one point in time. Well, tell everyone I, what that was because they, most people well, don't know. Yeah. Okay. It it uh, it goes back quite a while. It was right after Lance retired, and uh, I invited him to come on the ice with me, do a do a clinic with me, and uh, he did. And we had a lot of fun doing it. But we were doing some stick handling, player stick handling, and we had cones set up on the ice. And anybody that's been on the ice with with young players, and you put cones out there. It's a it's a yard sale. I mean, the cones are flying everywhere, and it wasn't uh, too long after that that uh, Lance came to me, and he, he he invented a tool for stick handling. And what it was was a hockey stick with pucks, two pucks screwed in the bottom, about twelve inches apart. And he said, "What do you think?" And I said, "Well, I said, yeah. I mean, it's." You know, it's kind of, they're going to knock that over, but it's going to stay in one place. It wasn't balanced well, and, and it was short. And um, so I we used that a couple times, and then it, it did a job. But one thing that, that it did that we neither one of us, I don't think, anticipated it would do is because of the, of the bar going across the top, or the stick in this case, it required kids to actually lift their stick off the ice and roll their wrists over to catch up to it. They couldn't sit there and just play chop chop with it. They actually had to learn upper hand wrist roll. And that wasn't one of our thought processes, I don't think, in going into this. But Lance had the idea and I said, great. He said, what do you think about about uh, you know making these? And I said, I think that's a great idea, Lance. You should you should pursue it. And he said, Well I don't want to do it by myself. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well that's no fun. He goes, why don't you come in with me? So at that point, we we went into it and uh, we 
made a design, mostly Lance and through some other people, some engineers, made a design that uh, turned into Sweet Hands. And um, we would go to different hockey tournaments, set up an expo, and we would basically show off our goods and sell our goods. And, uh, and then we'd package them and sell them on the Internet. And uh, we spent a lot of nights in, uh, in Lance's garage putting packages together. And uh, so that, that's how that kind of <laughs> started. And we had a lot of fun doing it. But it, it got to be big. It got to be a big, big thing and uh, bigger than I could handle with my, like we were getting into, in doing early morning sessions from six to seven, running a business and doing uh, some other skill stuff and then also throwing in uh, uh, scouting on top of that. And it just got to be a lot. Something had to go. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it, it became pretty clear what you know what the gravy train was i mean that business would ended up being uh sniper's edge hockey eventually but the yep. the sweet hands uh stick handling trainer that was the the first product but um yeah it did become big and <laughs> it was it was fun and you and i did some association um you Clinics, know con- yep. contracting where they would hire us for maybe to get ready for the the high school season, but mm-hmm. uh, how did you how did you first get into scouting, and at what level, and kind of just talk about your progression in that? Sure, sure. Um, I actually got into scouting. Um, my son got me into scouting. Now, when I say that, the way that all evolved was that when my son was a junior in high school, he played. Um, a before and after program for Cedar Rapids in the USHL. And which meant he, he basically moved down to Cedar Rapids, was there until November, came home, played this high school season. And then after that, he went back and finished the season in Cedar Rapids when he was a junior. Um, when he was a senior, he went back and played full time. Well, I had gotten to know the coaching staff, uh, Mark Carlson, the head coach, and at that time, A.J. Taves, uh, who now is a scout with uh, the Arizona, or excuse me, the Washington Capitals, has been for about almost 20 years, um, got to know him. And uh, the opportunity arose that they needed somebody. They didn't have anybody to cover uh, the kind of the upper Midwest, Minnesota area specifically. And they asked me if I was interested in a job. And I said, Sure. Yeah. I'd love to watch hockey. I like to evaluate players. So yeah, it's perfect. So I, that's how it started for me. And, uh, I was with them for 10 years and then I had an opportunity to take a position with the Des Moines Buccaneers, also at USHL as a director of player personnel slash head scout. And I had a number of regional guys under me. Um, and I did that for four years with them, uh, working for Davey Allison, who I know you know quite well and could share a story or two about Davey. But uh, did that for four years. And then uh, I got a call from uh, a gentleman with the Arizona Coyotes one day. And it was a, actually a, one, of their, one of their full-time scouts called me, uh, Robbie Pulford, and asked me if I was interested. And, uh, he, you know, and... and and working with in the NHL. And I said, absolutely. And uh, he set me up with Tim Bernhardt, who was the, uh, the head scout at the time, went through kind of an interview process. And, and that's where, that's where it, uh, that's how that got started with the Coyotes. Um, I was with them for three years. And uh, at that point in time, I saw the scouting, scouting piece, at least for certain in the NHL, changed dramatically if nothing else at least in the Arizona Coyotes and you and I have chatted about this before um our general manager at the time was his name was John Shaika and he was the youngest general manager in in um in the NHL for sure ever if maybe pro sports he was 28 at the time and but he was an analytics guy and i remember the very first meeting we had my first year he said i just want you guys to know that the analytics piece is a small part 
and it's just something we use kind of to double check things. You know, what you see out there, your opinions, your guts, that's what we really want. Well, that did a complete 180 between first year and third year. And we would watch, we would scout more games on the internet than we would going to see. And I, I got very soured of it. And at, at the end of that third year, they, they brought in a new, uh, uh, some new, new uh, management people. And the entire scouting staff, coaching staff, everybody, not the, not the, I shouldn't say the, the, the coaching staff because Rick Tockett was there at the time. That was his first year. Uh, he came in a year before. Um, he stayed, but everybody down in the, in the hockey ops end of it was gone. So we all got canned, which is typical in, the, in pro sports. And uh, I just, at that point, I just said, you know, this is a good time to, to take a rest, to stand back. And that's how it kind of ended for me. But uh, the people I met, um, the the what I learned, um, the experience of it, that that's I'll never forget that. And especially the people, uh, the people I worked with, the people that worked for other hockey clubs, um, I still run into at games, and uh, they're that's what you really miss. That's the part you miss. It's the all the camaraderie and the relationships. Um, so, so before, I mean, I want you to kind of talk about like how you would evaluate players, but how, how long have you been out of, of scouting four, from them? Uh, four years. So four years. So this would be the fifth year. This is the fifth year now. Yeah. Can you look back because you were pretty sour grapes at, uh, you know, when you left, but you had your thumbprint on you know, the draft for that last year there, did, did the analytics work? Do you know, did you ever go, <laughs> did you ever look back and see, you know, who was right? Well, if, if you can go by, not, not specifically, no, but if you can go by the success of the hockey club, probably didn't work out all that well. And the analytics piece was tried in Buffalo before Arizona tried it and it they were it failed for years um it was tried in in Florida where you played after you finished there but it was tried there and it it didn't it didn't have success um and i know that there's a place for it but it can't be your primary method for determining a player's value to a hockey club and you know the, even the 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 interviews uh, were you know we would get to do a shorter a short somewhat short interview with a player and then we turn over the results to the sports psychologist who was in Toronto and then she would take it from there and she would make the determinations whether they're you know how they are mentally um, but it, it 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 loses something when you take away the one on one just. You know, you got to watch a player. How does he, how does he skate to the bench after a bad shift? What's his mannerisms on the bench? How does he communicate with other uh, with his other players? Um, you know, and then in the interview process, is 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 this guy for real or is he a phony baloney? And there's been plenty of phony balonies that I've interviewed. Um, guys who have who have uh, the answers to every question because their agent or their advisor said they're going to ask this. Here's how you answer it. And you can just tell it's it's not them. You're not getting a true reading of them. Um, but then there was guys who were, were so authentic, it was crazy. And uh, you just love those guys because you could sit and talk with them for hours. Um, just the, You'd feel the passion. You'd feel the love. You'd feel, you know, where they want to be. I know guys who interviewed uh, Matthew Kachuk, and he said, what a great interview. Um, you know, I had the privilege of interviewing Mario Ferraro, who's now with San Jose, and um, probably mainly because he played for me when I was when I was in Des Moines. Uh, I got to know him well. But here's the most authentic player, authentic interview I've ever done in my life. Um, and and you know, so those guys, that means something. You know, those guys are going to be around a while. Those guys are team guys. Those guys are passionate guys. Those are the guys who are going to wear letters on their chest. 
Those are the guys you want. And you don't get that from analytics and you don't get that from a phone interview from a sports psychologist. When you were, when you were doing it, how, um, you know, talk about when it was the old way, would you would just sit around? I mean, is it like the movies where you sit around a room and you got, all right, here, we got this guy, where, where do we rank? And then you, everyone says their piece on him. How did that go? Well, we'd get, we'd have meetings, um, We'd have meetings in the in the fall, and they'd generally be during during training camp, and they'd usually they'd be in in a different location. Um, the NHL teams in the fall, they most teams get in a get in some kind of a tournament or round robin play at a certain location. I know we were always with uh, the LA Kings, San Jose, us, and and Colorado. So one year we were in Arizona for it the next year we were in where were we we were in san jose i believe oh vegas was in it too so the next year we were in vegas and that was our first meeting we had and we got to see the players and you know the team and then we'd have a meeting in january and that would usually be the back down in arizona and then everybody would have to talk about their players you'd get up in front of the whole room and chat about the guys you liked. And uh, and so you'd have to give reasons why you like them, and you'd have to have video on them. And so they, you know, you'd, you'd submit video on them, and they'd show the video on them. And um, you talk about it, and then uh, the head scout would then have his comments on it, and uh, then it would move on to the next guy and his players. Um, and then when you got to – so that's kind of how the winter meeting went – and then you'd get the spring meeting, which is which is before the draft, and that's where the rubber hit the road, if you will, because now you started to have to make some decisions on guys, and um, you know you kind of had to had to put it all on the table. If it was a guy you liked, you got to stand up for him because there was always going to be naysayers about that guy, and you can't, you know, you 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 learn quick that you got to stand your ground um, because if they're not looking for at least at that time, they weren't looking for just head nodders. They were looking for guys with input. And if you like this guy, why do you like him? What makes him better than this guy? What, sell what me, you, sell me what, sell me on it. Yeah, and that's what it was. You had to sell him on your guy. And if you didn't sell him, then you were no value to him. And you, you learned fast that you, you, gotta, you, you just got to stand up for your guys. And right or wrong, you live or die with them. Um, you can't be wishy-washy. And um, and then we'd then the fourth time we'd get together would be the draft, and um, and then it would pretty much be in the hands of the, the GM, uh, director of player personnel, director of scouting. They they'd ask you questions sometimes. You know they you'd be talking, you'd be considering a player and. They maybe throw it back on on you know one of the guys who who brought him in and ask some questions about him, but ultimately the decision came um, came on the shoulders of the the guys who made the big money. From your perspective, you've been part of the game um, your whole life, and from a number of different perspectives, but. Um, mainly as a skill development guy and then also as a an evaluator you know how do you where do you think the state of hockey is right now as far as you know from a you know a heartbeat does it have a strong heartbeat right now i think it's got a great heartbeat right now your the depth in in hockey today is unlike i've ever seen in my life and it's pretty well documented by um the if you just simply look at the college teams, and I'm not just talking about even the Division One teams. I'm talking about the Division Three teams. There's so many good hockey players. It's created a a level of college hockey that is far better than I've ever seen it. Um, you've got the the NHL. Even though the game has changed a lot over the years, um, they've encouraged skill and speed more, which makes it a more exciting game. To watch and a more exciting game to spill to, to play and you've got some of the top players in the world playing in the nhl right now that are pretty unbelievable to watch 
Um, no, I think the game of hockey overall is in great shape. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, as, as I think it's better than it's ever been. And for, like I said, for the a number of reasons, including the number of, of players that, that are, are, that get to play the game at the minor league levels today. Um, there's hockey everywhere. You know, you get hockey players from Arizona, California. I mean, places you'd never imagine you would ever get hockey players from are playing at the highest level and some of the best players at those levels. You've worked with players that went on to play Division One hockey, your son being one of them, uh, the Olympics, the NHL, uh, boys and girls. Where, uh, you know, you've seen a lot of ones that have made it, but also ones that didn't, you know, what advice can you give some young hockey hopeful that has some um, lofty goals? The best thing I can, the best advice I can give is if you've got a passion and you love this game, never stop, never quit. I've, there's a player, you know him, and I'll even, we'll even talk about him for a second because you work with him as well. His name is Davis Kirkendall. Here's just an example of probably the most passionate player I've ever worked with. And like you said, he's not in the NHL, but the kid's drive and passion was, 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 there's nobody that's had more in my mind. And uh, he is, is presently after playing, after playing, finally getting to play high school hockey in Minnesota, coming from Ohio, um, and then playing a year of, of midget major, uh, U18 in Detroit with Honeybaked after high school, when everybody else was going to junior, he was going to a midget program and coming back, playing for uh, in the North American League, playing Division Three college hockey, ultimately at a good school in Wisconsin. And he's still playing. He's in his third year now um, and playing pro hockey and in Tennessee. And I wouldn't have given this kid a snowball chance of playing anywhere after maybe high school. Yeah. And he's still playing at 26 years old, 27 years old. He's still playing yeah. and still, still passionate about it. So never give up. If it's your dream, don't give up. You, you may not have the skill everybody else has, but you can make up for it with the work ethic. And you know as well as anybody about the work ethic in this game. It, it'll carry you much farther than God-given skill will. Yeah. That I promise you. Yep. Isn't that the truth? Nuggets. Like that nugget. Um, yep. If people want to find out... Now, now do, you, do, you, do you work with female players and... You know, or do you just focus more on the? Yeah, no, I, I actually last couple of years I've uh, in, it trained a, a girl who's playing Division One college hockey out east right now, uh, and uh, and the, the, the girls have changed so much. Um, when I first started working with girls, which was many many years ago, um, it was very frustrating. It was it was more of a social thing. It was it was frustrating to me and I didn't enjoy it. And I don't think I did a good job with them um, because I wanted them to be more than they wanted to be. And that's never, that never works. Um, but today's girls playing at the, at the high school level, um, you've got some darn good committed and very committed players playing there. And girls are really good listeners. They're really good followers of directions. And they're they're fun to work with because of that. So yes, I I I I've worked with two now. She's the second one, and they've both been delightful to work with, and uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Where can people find out more about what you have going on if they want to um, employ your services? I I know that it's. You used to be the the grand poobah, but now it's kind of transitioned here to your son in law. Is yes. Pat is Pat kind of you know? So talk yeah. about the lineup and where people can learn more about what you guys got going on. Sure, uh, individual skills clinics. Um, it's on uh, 
it's on uh you can you can get it on the on the internet if you go to www uh, individualskills.net is that um, on the internet is that on the yeah. internet okay yeah it's a website <laughs> that'd be the internet yeah it would be on, it's a website okay um <laughs> and and uh yeah now it's uh I basically turned over the reins to my son-in-law, Pat O'Leary. Uh, I'm still on the ice. I still do all the sessions, as does him. And uh, uh, a partner we, we took in about, um, well, I'd say probably about eight, nine years ago now, maybe even 10, uh, Blake Sloan. So it's the three of us on the ice. And then Pete Samargia is also on the ice with us, uh, working with the goaltenders. So those are the four of us that are out there every time. It's a program that goes from June through August. Uh, it's it's uh, two times weekly on ice, and it's all skill development stuff, um, all small group stuff, all station stuff. Um, yeah, and it's we have different levels. Uh, we We basically have one level we, we nobody we don't take anybody that's at least not a second year bantam um you know that's probably the, the youngest we'll take going into a high school program and then we have the returning high school guys and then we have a program for um older guys junior players college players uh, that type um but yeah that is all on uh you go to the website and you can get all the information on that. I think they just open that up for registrations. Um, both, both of my boys uh, used to do it. So, you know, I was a cabin guy for over two decades. <laughs> yeah. And my wife and I, we would just bow on Sundays because once our kids could drive, they would have to go back and do the individual skills clinics Sunday, you know, late afternoon, early evening. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I would be surfing and <laughs> got to stay up there one more night without yep. the kids. Uh, so, yeah, you guys have been doing it for a, a long, long time and have, um, you know, impacted positively. Uh a, a lot, a lot of high-end players and my boys uh, and I couldn't be more grateful for, you know, what you guys offer because it, it was, uh, it was perfect. You know, everyone's looking to get better and you guys were doing that. And, um, it's, it's been a formula that, that works. I mean, you guys, the, the Sunday night, the, the Wednesday night, uh, it, it, it was awesome. And you're still doing it, so yeah. It, it fit in with other things they they they're doing. It doesn't interfere with they're doing summer training programs at their high school, or um, if they've got you know their their strength training during the week and things of that nature. It didn't interfere with it, and that's why we kind of started it that way. And it's it's kind of stuck simply for that reason. It's very uh, you can do it alongside of multiple other things and not have it interfere. So yeah, it's been good. It's been a you know what, Peter, I got to say. In, in kind of in closing here, I, I've loved every minute I've been in love with this game. Um, I've been involved with this game, I should say. Uh, there isn't anything I would do differently. Um, you know, I, I, I've had great experiences and developed great friendships, um, long-lasting lifetime friendships with players and associates I've worked with as well, including yourself over the years. And uh, it's just a... There, to me, that's the most important part of this is what you what you gain along the way, what I gain along the way. And um, I've gained an awful lot. I wouldn't change a thing. I love every minute of it. You got, uh, well, you, you kind of said that we we're ending it. I wasn't planning on ending this episode, oh. but I mean, no, I'm just. <laughs> I think you were kind of starting to close on me. We, we are. Was, we I are. You, I, I felt you going to the bullpen for the writing. <laughs> we are starting to to wind her down. I I have to ask you, could yeah. you go back? Because for me, this it's a easy answer for me. Um, what direction I would go, but could you go back and say, all right, I, I I'm not going to do what I've done the last thirty years, the Sunday nights working with Bantam age or above. Could you go back to working with five and six year olds two days 
two days a week and you know change that and do that now instead of what you're currently doing and do that for the next seven years no <laughs> i didn't think you could <laughs> there's not even a there's there's not even a, a hesitation um <laughs> i wouldn't be any good to them i wouldn't be any good to me <laughs> no you just so, you know you move up the chain a little bit and and you know as much as i i enjoyed my time working with the younger kids when I did um, y- your your patients aren't quite what they once were and and you're y- you know for so long now I've worked with players that have wanted to be better I mean I mean I mean really want to be better than they are then to go back to a time when most of the players I wanted them to be better than they wanted to be just that's a tough thing it's a tough thing when you see something in a young player and and you want so much for him to to grab onto that and just have the passion you have for it but they don't and it's very difficult um when i look back on those times and i made a lot of mistakes with players in my own mind is wanting it more than they did and like i said you can never want it more than the player wants it as a as an instructor because it just doesn't work. I'll take the under. I'll take the the overachiever anytime with less yeah. skill. Isn't that funny? That because that interests me. Like I like working with older players. Uh, you know when I'm doing what I do. But if I could go back, if I had to go on the ice and I had to pick older players. Or going back to the get the at the beginning the the five six seven eight year olds, I'd go back to the beginning. Would you really? I would. That that's where I I love I love that time, uh, because the change is obviously so much more noticeable, um, and I can see both sides. But I've 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 never gravitated toward the tactical part of the game. It's always been the technical part. Yep. Um, and but for me, you know, I I enjoy, you know, that's where I that's where I had the most satisfaction. And even doing what I do now, um, if I can get a, a seven or an eight year old uh, in in front of them that hasn't had any really guidance with the stick, sure. I know I know exactly what the next few lessons are going to be. You know, right. um, so yeah. Well, you are you are you know I'll say that you are. We've done, you and I have done a number of, of very young kids and, and way back. And you were phenomenal with them. You know, there was, a, there was a passion you had for working with those young kids. I mean, the young, young kids. And it's a passion to work with those kids that I did not have at the time. Even. Um, I could see it. In you. you just glowed when you were out with those kids. You had more fun than they had. And that's <laughs> seriously. You yeah. did. You go goofed around with them. You joked with them. You, you know, it wasn't all work. It was what you can't have at that age. If it's all work, you're going to turn them off. As you know, you got to make it fun. And you did a great job. You made every practice fun. And uh, my hats off to you for that, my friend, because you did a great job with them. Well, you know, you you and many others uh, were definitely uh, a. A mentoring force and teaching me how a practice was structured and how you communicate you know that you're in charge when you're you're in front of the you know a bunch of 12 year olds uh that just want to handle the puck and shoot the puck and <laughs> you know but uh, exactly. <laughs> uh so true uh do you have any regrets in hockey um, I can't say that I really do. Um, things I would have done differently. I guess I, I would have I would have worked on my game harder as a younger player, but that wasn't the way it was done back then. You know, you back then you you played you played football in the fall, you played hockey in the winter, you played yeah. baseball in the spring. You know, it wasn't. And then in the summertime, you were just a kid. You just played. You just goofed around. 
And um, and mom opens up the back door and says, get out of here. Exactly. (laughs) I don't want to see you in four hours, you know. Exactly. I'll see you back here at noon for lunch. (laughs) Don't come back. And that's the way that's the way it was. And, and, you know, nothing you, you had to use a lot of creativity and imagination as a kid back then, where it seems today things are so outlined for you and so so regimented. You know, and, and okay, it's in the summertime, you're a high school kid. Okay, I'm on the ice with Rick from 6 to 7. I'm doing my off ice from 10 to 11.30. I have STP at 3 o'clock. You know, it's just all boom, 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 boom. It's like, when are you going to be a kid? Yeah. And, and so I, I, I do regret the fact that I, I, maybe that I didn't have the opportunity to work harder at being a player when I was younger. Um, that was probably my, my, my biggest regret was, and even when I was, you know, in my, in my later teens, not working as hard as I, as I should have worked. Like I said, the light bulb didn't go off till I was probably 19, 20 years old. Um, and you know, I missed a lot of opportunity within that. Um, but that was the times that's the, what they were. Yeah. All right, man. Um, I just, it could be like the old days. Cause the, the one thing you didn't mention, you mentioned a lot of late nights, you know, packing the sweet hands boxes and putting the, <laughs> the spikes into the little plastic bag <laughs> And we had the stick handling balls and you know, yep, had to put them in the you know, tubes. Them. And uh, <laughs> we, have, we always had a couple beers, you know, oh, yeah. uh, with that. I mean, we, we could crack a bottle of wine right now and talk for another four hours. But uh, maybe it'll be a future episode. We'll have to maybe do this again. Hey, I would love it. That would be great. <laughs> Well, uh, just congratulations on an amazing hockey journey. And thank you for your life commitment to the sport. Uh, you can't be around this game as long as you have if you're a bad person. <laughs> you know, you just can't. <laughs> uh, you have to be doing something right to to keep getting all the opportunities you've gotten. So all I know is that when our paths crossed, uh, I knew you wanted every player that was under your guidance, uh, that was listening you wanted them to be the best version of themselves that, that they could be and to help them get a little closer to whatever they were chasing. So thanks for making the game of hockey a little better than when you found it and, you know, just impacting so many players year after year in, in a positive way, helping them through, a, you know, a journey that is not always easy. No, you're, you're, very welcome. I mean, I appreciate the kind words. Um, I truly do. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to come on the, the podcast with you and, and chat a little bit about the, the game we both we both love. Well, I, <laughs> we're at that point where, uh, you know, you, you get this young kid and I'm like, yeah, him and I were business partners and he was I mean, everyone looked at he would when he spoke. Everyone listened to what that guy said at one point in his life. Um, you know, I don't want anyone to be forgotten because you know we can learn so much from uh, other people's experiences. We can accelerate our own growth by you know deleting some stuff because we know that that's a possibility. It might surface in our own life. Uh, so that's my hope with this this podcast uh thank you for for sharing your journey there's been there's just so many things that uh were shared i know others can benefit from um if there's any way that i can uh, help you guys what you got going on over at uh individual skills i don't go on the ice anymore um but uh i can Throw some good vibes your way if you, that's what you need. <laughs> well, that's appreciated. I, I appreciate the offer, Pat. <laughs> I really do. I just look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, well, we're going to have to. Uh, I had, I'm had. i still working with Davis Kirkendall as well. Uh, he said that before he left uh, for his season that he was going to meet with you. So maybe we'll have to go uh, 
get to the old uh, Chinese buffet and <laughs> hunker down with a little green tea. And <laughs> so, well, thanks for that being would be here. Great. That would be great. Well, I appreciate it, uh, Pitt. Thank, thank you for having me on. Uh, and you have yourself a, a great day. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Rick Beckfeld and hearing his lifelong hockey journey and how he continues to help players and the game of hockey get better today than it was yesterday. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.